Okay, everybody, here's um, session 3.3. This is kind of an introduction to some finance issues for nonprofits to consider. Um, from this class session, I want you to know the significance of, to nonprofits of the following three revenue sources private fundraising, government grants, and commercial activities. These different revenue sources have, have attributes that will be important to the way nonprofits operate. I also want you to be able to track revenue trends against inflation and also calculate revenue elasticity relative to other things like GDP. Okay, let's talk about nonprofit revenue sources. Um, and the reading was relates to this, right? The, the, there are three primary funding sources for nonprofits. There's private fundraising, government sources, and commercial activities. And then the author evaluates these according to the volatility of the revenue source, the effect the revenue source has on goal displacement, meaning getting the nonprofit to do something different than they would otherwise do. And also on process and structure effects, meaning how does how do these revenue sources change the way nonprofits operate internally? We're going to go through each of the three revenue sources and evaluate them by each of the three attributes. So as far as private fundraising goes, um, one thing that's important to understand is that private fundraising is characterized by connectedness with very large donors. In fact, we talked about we kind of implied this in the tax unit that we did in the last block. Right, where I pointed out that most of the donations actually in the United States actually come from very wealthy individuals. What that means is that most nonprofits that are raising money raise money from wealthy individuals. Um, and those large donors, as a result, have a huge effect on how nonprofits operate. First of all, there's a lot of volatility that results from that because if you require if you rely on a large donor for a, a substantial chunk of your revenue, then uh, if that donor changes his or her mind, you're done. You've just lost, you know, 45% of your normal annual revenue. And this obviously exposes you to a lot of risk. Um, and so as a result, there's quite a bit of volatility in private fundraising as a revenue source. There's also a lot of goal displacement, because if you go pitch to a large donor, what happens is that donor says, hey, you know, I like what you're doing, but instead of doing it in Utah County, will you do it in Washington County, um, down in southern Utah? Well, if you agree to that, then you, your goals have just been displaced. You might have reasons you prefer to be in Utah County, but instead you follow the money. And a lot of nonprofits find that they do that. <clears throat> Um, part of the problem also is that a lot of large donor funds come through private foundations and private foundations are imposing quite a few more structural and process changes. They're expecting more from nonprofits, especially as it relates to internal management policies and as it relates to impact assessment. And so as a result, foundations are driving a lot of the changes that come from this. A lot of donors simply don't care about that stuff, but foundation uh, grant makers do. So I have a little helpful table here. So private fundraising volatility is high. Goal displacement is strong. And as far as process and structure effects go, foundations are driving that mostly, but it comes in the form of much more formalized processes and more business administration skills. <clears throat> Which, by the way, is one of the advantages of doing your MPA in the Marriott School, because you're in a place where business administration skills are taught and, and emphasized and it actually gives you a leg up on a lot of other MPA graduates from other programs. All right, let's move on to government sources. Governor revenue sources are less volatile generally because of slow policy change, um, but political shifts can cause temporary high volatility. Uh, for example, if a new administration is elected, uh, if there's a big shift in Congress, what usually happens is new programs are started um, and that's where a lot of the process change goes. Um, however, a lot of government programs, once they're started, tend to be pretty stable sources of revenue. Now, the last few years have kind of bucked this trend. However, there's a lot of budget cutting that happened that has not happened historically. Uh, for example, if you relied heavily on AmeriCorps volunteers, a lot of AmeriCorps funding dried up during the last few years. And so there have been changes, but again, it reflects this idea of, of general stability with temporary bouts of volatility. For a long time, you could rely on AmeriCorps funding to pay for staff, and then all of a sudden, the money was gone. <clears throat> and so that reflects a lot what that's like. Um, although there's not a lot of gold displacement from government sources, there is a lot of initial gold displacement, meaning that a lot of nonprofits get started because government funding has been authorized for some activity. So it's not so much that you change what you do because the government wants you to behave differently. It's more that you start something new because all of a sudden, the government is paying for it. Um, and I will say this, the government grants require a level of bureaucracy that rivals the government itself. Um, quite frankly, a lot of nonprofits will actually pass on government funds. <clears throat>
and they do that because the grant requirements are so onerous that it's not worth their time to seek the government money. Um, so putting this into effect, um, volatility is low for long periods and then briefly high. Gold displacement is moderate, it's mostly initial, like we talked about, right? It, it, it's sort of like initial mission choice. And there's a lot of formalization and bureaucracy that comes by seeking government grants. Okay, so this last source, commercial activities, is when nonprofits sell things like goods or services. And this is generally a less volatile source because nonprofits typically enjoy stable markets. Whatever it is they're providing is usually a market where they can rely on regular repeat customers. Gold displacement, interestingly enough, has not happened. Contrary to expectations, during the decades in which nonprofits were increasingly relying on commercial activities for their revenue, a lot of people worried that the that the the sort of market fringe people, right, low income people, marginalized people, people who are marginalized because of racial or ethnic background, right, basically the people who are kind of left out of a normal market economy. The fear was that if nonprofits were relying on commercial activities for their funding, they would eventually abandon these people whom the markets have not helped. Well, the truth is, over time, that's not been a problem. A lot of nonprofits still carry on very vital and important missions in underserved communities, but relying on commercial revenue helps them to do it with more stability and reliability, which is actually pretty great. And as a result of this, business methods are now very common in nonprofit organizations, um, and a lot of MBAs go get jobs in nonprofits, for example. And so there's more and more emphasis on, the, on that skill set because of commercial activities as a revenue source. So the volatility for commercial activities is moderate to low. There's actually a weak effect as far as gold displacement is concerned, and there's a lot of rationalization for activities, meaning like, like a lot is sort of based on bottom line thinking rather than on pure mission thinking. Um, and obviously business administration tools have changed the way nonprofits work. Okay, so those are the three governments, or those are the three revenue sources I wanted to talk about. Let's talk about diversifying revenue. To illustrate these concepts, I'm going to pull up some numbers from the March of Dimes. Specifically, I'm going to use 990 information from 2005, 2004, and 2003. Now, if that seems like really outdated um, uh, information to use for our discussion, I mean, it, it is. It's old. It's almost. It's a decade old now. But I'm using this because it helps me illustrate a cool principle. Um, the numbers are just kind of perfect for this, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, first, I want to make, take an aside and make sure everybody remembers the difference between nominal dollars and real dollars. A nominal dollar is a dollar in name only, right? A dollar today, if I have a dollar in my wallet today and I leave it in my wallet, I still have a dollar there a year later, but the purchasing power of that dollar has changed, and that's because of inflation. Over time, dollars lose their value slowly. Um, in the U.S., we've had kind of an average of 3% inflation for about a decade. That's varied a little bit, obviously, but that's been an average. What happens is that dollar I kept in my wallet for a year is no longer worth a dollar, it's now worth less. Um, so, for example, using using these numbers from 2005 and 2006, if I had $1,000 in 2005, I'd still have that 1000 in 2006, except it's not worth $1,000 anymore. Instead, it's only worth $970, um, and that's because the value of the $1,000 has decreased over time. So knowing that and keeping that in mind, it's worth tracking revenue against inflation, something that a lot of nonprofits are not sophisticated. They don't do, even though it's not that hard to do. They just don't think that way. Um, ideally, a nonprofit would have its revenue growth beat inflation, right? I mean, your revenue, your income year after year needs to be growing faster than inflation. Otherwise, you're slowly losing money. One of the hard questions for the nonprofit industry is which inflation measure do you use? We'll talk in class about the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, the PPI, which is the Producer Price Index, and the IPD, which is the Impl Implicit Price Deflator. The first one is used for consumer goods, the second one is used for producer goods, and the third one is used for government agencies. If you'll notice, there's not an inflation measure that's, that's created specifically for nonprofits. So you kind of have to pick the inflation measure you think is best suited for nonprofit activities. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you rely heavily on donations, you'll probably want to use CPI, right? Because consumers are the ones giving you their money, and consumers are facing inflation as measured by the CPI. So generally, you're going to want to look at the revenue source. If you're relying on a lot on government grants, then you'd probably use the IPD. Okay. Um, with that in mind, 
uh, let's actually do this. So this equation is a really simple rate of change equation. We just know how the percentage to which something changes from one year to the next. So you take year two, subtract year one, and divide the result by year one, and that gives you a rate of change. Um, so we can take, we can calculate inflation from 2004 to 2005. I'm using CPI numbers here. Now the numbers you see in this equation, those are just index numbers. They're just uh, numbers that are only important relative to each other. Um, and these are the CPI numbers for that year that is put out by the St. Louis Fed. And what you can see is the CPI number for 2005 is 199.0. <clears throat> the same number for a year earlier is 191.4, divided the result by year one. And we get an inflation rate of 3.97% for that year. So from 2004 to 2005, inflation was almost 4%. Um, we can do the same calculation, the same rate of change calculation for general public support, that is to say donations that came into the March of Dimes during the same time period. And so here we're taking their millions of dollars from the, for those two time periods, calculating a rate of change, and what we get is 2.73. So inflation grew by 4% during that year's time period but the revenue for March of Dimes only grew by 2.73%. But here's the funny thing. I bet you anything, the CEO for March of Dimes went into the board of directors and said, hey, look, everybody, our, our, um, our revenue grew by 2.73%. And the board pats him on the back and says, hey, good job, way to grow the revenue. But in the, reali the reality is, is that their revenue shrunk, right? Because inflation grew at 4%, their revenue only grew by less than three. So they're a little over 1% worse off in revenue than they were the year before. Even though on the appearance revenue grew, because they didn't grow faster than inflation, in every practical sense, their revenue actually shrunk. Okay, now we're going to talk about elasticity. Elasticity of revenue is interesting because it's a way to evaluate rate. It's a way to evaluate as one thing changes relative to another. Businesses calculate elasticity. Government agencies calculate elasticity, so why shouldn't nonprofits do it? Um, but do very many nonprofits do probably use elasticity measures? Probably not. Understanding the elasticity of revenue can allow a nonprofit to plan for times of plenty and scarcity. If you have a long enough track record of revenue over a time period, then you can kind of evaluate how your revenue changes as important things change, like like the growth of the economy. And so. It's an important point to emphasize this is not useful for new or small nonprofits where there's too much volatility in their revenue. It just would be noisy information and not helpful. But it would be helpful for a large nonprofit, for example, March of Dimes, that relies heavily on very large public fundraising campaigns. Okay, so let's let's do some math. Um, if you'll notice, my equation for elasticity is the same is is a rate of change calculation divided by another rate of change. That, that's all elasticity is, is comparing one rate of change against another. And so, so here we have elasticity of general public support relative to GDP. That's the math I'm doing. So I'm, ch I'm calculating the rate of change first for general public support for March of Dimes during that, during that one year period from 04 to 05. We already know what that rate of change is, right? It's 2.73%. I'm dividing that by the rate of change in the economy, and that's trillions of dollars. It turns out you don't have to use the same units because um, on top it's millions, on bottoms it's trillions. We don't care about that. We just care about the percentages that result from the top and bottom calculation. Uh, anyway, when we do that math, we get an elasticity of 0.399. Now, I, I'm not sure what you guys have learned about elasticity in your previous classes. Um, essentially the way elasticity works is if you have an elasticity of one it means the two things move together at the same change so a one percent change in one thing means a one percent change in the other thing that's what elasticity of one means if you have an elasticity of less than one then that means as one thing changes the other thing moves in the same direction but not quite as much so here where GDP is changing the revenue from March of Dimes changes not a lot but a little bit Okay, well, if we do, and so it tells you that as the economy grows, donations grow, but not a lot for March of Dimes, at least not as much as the economy grows. Um, and the same calculations, by the way, if you do it for 2003 to 2004, it gives you an elasticity of 0.937, which is close to one, right? 
I would wager that if we did these elasticity calculations over many years, we would probably find that March of Dimes has an elasticity somewhere between 0.3 and 0.9, probably averaging around 0.7 or so. And that would tell us that over time, as the economy grows, March of Dimes revenue grows, but not quite as fast as the economy. Now this would also predict that when the economy tanks, March of Dimes revenue goes down, but not as bad as the economy goes down. To know that for sure, we'd want the calculations for the, the downturn of the business cycle that started in 2008, but you get the idea. Okay, so nonprofits diversifying revenue is important because nonprofits generally have very little revenue diversity, and the problem is if you rely too much on one source of revenue, then you're going to have, um, <clears throat> if you rely too much on one source of revenue, then you're going to uh, expose yourself to higher volatility if something happens to that revenue source. So the purpose of diversifying revenue is to protect against risk. And when we get in class, I'm going to tell you guys a story about the executive director of the March of Dimes, or no, sorry, of the Make-A-Wish Foundation for the Greater Bay Area. Um, you know, we went and visited her on a career trip a few years back, and uh, I have a favorite story to tell about revenue diversification that relates to what she told our students. Um, you can track elasticity of revenue by individual revenue source versus the economy, and that gives you a sense of risk. And so, for example, the way you do that is you could create, you could do what's called a weighted portfolio calculation, where you take the elasticity of each element in your revenue, like general public support, government grants, earned income. You could evaluate, okay, what is the elasticity of each of those, and then weight it by the total share of your portfolio. And you guys did weighting calculations in your in your quantitative decision analysis class. Anyway, um, if you can, so in here you can get a, porf a weighted portfolio elasticity. So like all of your revenue is is elastic in what way or not. Um, so here, I took three revenue sources, and it's general public support, earned income, and government grants. And what you can see is that um, the, the, here we have the last the first pairing of numbers is the elasticity of general public support times the weight of the portfolio, which is almost 95 percent. It's 94 percent of the portfolio that comes from general public support. Next, in that middle set of numbers, you see an elasticity of 0.21. Well, that's relative to government grants, and government grants make up about 5 percent of the March of Dimes portfolio. And the last one is earned income, and that's an elasticity of 0.55 and it only makes up about 1% of their revenue portfolio. Well, that gives us a weighted elasticity of 0.36. And what that means is their total revenue portfolio, not just one revenue source, but all of their revenue has an average elasticity of 0.36. You do the same calculations for the prior year and you'll get an elasticity of 0.878. It shouldn't surprise us, right? Because general public support is such a huge amount of their revenue, it's 95% roughly. But also what it tells us is that their other revenue sources are pretty stable no matter how much the economy changes. And so generally March of Dimes is not going to be subject to the same risks as a nonprofit that has high elasticity numbers relative to GDP. So if a nonprofit has a short history or any of these calculations valuable, the answer is no, because you don't have enough data to get reliable information over time. Um, we're going to talk about these last two questions of different ways you can use these elasticity calculations to give you good insights. Okay, and if you want to practice this, this is how you do it. You pick any nonprofit you know about. You go to GuideStar.org and download their the 990 filings. You could pick 2010 and 2009, for example. And then you calculate the elasticity of their public support compared to GDP. And I gave you the GDP numbers for 2009 and 2010, so you could use that for math and for practice. Anyway, that's it, and we will see you all in class.